read in the, in the brochure that the Institute was founded in 1995, and essentially it's a think tank that promotes capitalism and free markets. Our mission is to formulate and promote public policies for the Bahamas based on the principles of limited government, individual freedom, and the rule of the law. As I said, the brochure gives us a little bit of a history, but there is one area that I particularly like to talk about, and it's one that uh, I think called to me as I was approached as a director, and that's the student lecture series, uh, which is sponsored by the Templeton Foundation and in collaboration with the College of the Bahamas. Uh, the, university. the university, I'm sorry, of the Bahamas now, that's correct. Um, the goal here is real simple. Easy enough. What we're trying to do is broaden the minds of the young persons towards understanding the concepts of capitalism and free markets, the importance of economics, not only in their personal life, but also in professional environment. And, uh, and you know, if you're really, really lucky, maybe one of these days, someone who has passed through and maybe got an inkling of what we're talking about here ends up in a position of influence and, you know, would be able to actually be a part of that sound fiscal policy that we desperately need in the Bahamas. So we are, we are very pleased to be a part of that initiative. And one of the things that is coming out of that um, is an essay competition very shortly that's actually next week, the 19th of Feb, if I'm not mistaken. Um, we've asked the schools to allow their students who are doing you know, classes at certain levels to participate in something, uh, uh, an essay. And the, this is the book we're giving them to read, Economics in One Lesson. Um, I think it's a very interesting read if anybody has the opportunity and wishes to get a copy. Please, by all means, do so. Um, but it's a means of getting the young persons engaged into what we do. And, and this is one of the reasons why we think it's important that we, we align ourselves in this way. Um, as I told you, we, we were founded in 1995, and then the first president, uh, deceased now, was Joan Thompson, President Emer Emeritus. Um, and we are pleased to have here, I think it's her grandson? Son-in-law, son I'm sorry. Peter Phillips, somewhere, there he is. Um, <laughs> Mr. Phillips, and again, just a personal thank you for being down here. Uh, I think you, are, you live in Canada? Okay, you're here. Okay, great. All right. I also want to just take a couple of minutes just to um, introduce a couple of our uh, officers. There's Rick Lewar, president slash treasurer. There's just wave. Jorge is, was, ah, there he is, waving over there. Um, is Sydney Sweeting? I, no. Uh, Randy Forbes, Peter Young, back in the back there. I know I saw him. Uh, the Costa, uh, Leandra Fakas, and of course, so yes, yeah, who's now going to sit there? And then, of course, there's myself. So, again, one of the big topics of the evening uh, is, in, is essentially the presentation, and we'll, we'll get into that by Mr. Clean in a few minutes, but also on your table is another brochure that talks about the upcoming lectures that are going to be hosted by the NASA Institute. Again, I encourage you all to take a look at it. There are things that may be of interest, maybe not to yourselves, but to other persons you may know. Um, on the 13th of March, there's Mr. Brandon Turner, who's going to talk about two kinds of uh, liberalism. And then on the 5th of April, Benjamin Powell, talking about a subject I think should be very interesting to us out of poverty. So please, by all means, if you can take these and disperse these, before the end of the evening we will talk a little bit more about how to get in contact with us. Um, the Institute's uh, website is listed on most of the brochure, and we encourage you to go to the website, learn a little bit more about us, and hopefully become a member at some point in the near future. So, what is entrepreneurship? 
So look up the definition, you know, you can go with it. It's a complex term that is often defined simply as running your own business. But we know there's a difference between running a business uh, or being a business owner versus being an entrepreneur. And while one can be both, I think being an entrepreneur also speaks towards the attitude. Um, it's a much broader than the creation of a business venture. And in fact, at its core, it's a way of thinking and acting. It's imagining new ways to solve problems and create value. The best script I've heard is by Jenny Ta, CEO and founding part of VC Networks Co, who said, and I quote, most successful entrepreneurs are typically confident and self-motivated. They are tenacious, but understand their own limitations. Instead of following the status quo, entrepreneurs have a healthy disrespect for the established rules and often set out to do things that others may not have the courage to pursue. They are willing to fail and start over again. Internalizing the lessons they've learned to create something new and improved. I absolutely love that definition right there. So as someone who can take an idea, whether it's a product or service, and have the skill set, the will, and courage to take extreme risks to do whatever it takes to turn that concept into reality. And not only bring it to the market, but make it a viable product or service that people either need or want. So with that as the backdrop, I'm going to invite Mr. DaCosta Bethel to introduce our nominees and present our NASA Institute Freedom Award. Please give him a round of applause. <laughs> Thank you very much, Richard, for that um, introduction to entrepreneurship. And I had a brief description that just says that a per is a person who organizes and begins an enterprise, especially a business with considerable initiative and risk. And although there are many traits that mark entrepreneurs, perhaps the most important are passion, and motivation. In other words, is there something that you can work at over and over again and not get bored? Is it something that you can work at for the rest of your life? Additionally, entrepreneurs, they take risks. They take substantial risks. Uh, but not all risk takers are successful. And the successful entrepreneur is someone who looks at the alternatives, weighs the options, and is persistent and consistent with driving his idea forward. And you know, they don't know what the unknowns are, and they, they plan, they have some reserve for the unknown unknowns. And to a greater or lesser extent, all of our nominees have these three key elements of passion, motivation, and taking risks. And speaking about not of being not afraid to take risks, our, our first nominee, Mr. Peter Bates, is a stellar example of taking risks. Because it's a very real part of the story of the sign man. Back in the late 80s, after financially ruining divorce and loss of a senior position in a U.S. personal recruiting firm, Peter re returned home and took up a position with Mora Lumber Company. And while there, he noted that there was a need for the improved um, delivery of, of, of signs, signage throughout the country. And in a couple of years, he was able to sell his shares in that personnel recruiting firm that garnered him a significant, if not substantial, a substantial sum of money. And Peter decided, along with his wife, Kate, and daughter, Cindy, to invest that entire sum in one venture. It was literally a do-or-die initiative. He didn't know whether that, that service would be, or, or th those goods would be accepted locally. 
And we're proud to say that the sign man, not only was it accepted and um, flourished, they are now in their third expansion of that particular facility. So it was a huge leap of faith. And they continue to evolve. And Peter and the sign man are involved in numerous civic um, activities. So they, as a, as a corporate citizen, they contribute significantly uh, in a non-business way to the development of the country. So please join me in congratulating one of our nominees for this 2018 award, Peter Bates. Peter, just stand and give us a stand and give us a wave. Just stand and give us a wave. <laughs> I mentioned motivation, and the next one of our nominees, Mr. Michael Simonet, really typifies being motivated. Michael's first marketing company managed a two-masted schooner that was used in one of the James Bond movies locally, and his clients, uh, which were very high-end, frequently complained about or commented on the shortage or, or the, the dearth of tour, tours uh, in the Bahamas. So noting this, it, it motivated Michael to begin operating a tour and transportation company um, used with one bus. <laughs> and because of the the high-end nature of his clients, he had to ensure that his uh, service providers, his staff, were able to meet all of the needs of those clients. And he was able to engage uh, the Walt Disney Institute to provide training for his company as it grew. And grew it did, uh, to the point where today the Michael Simonet Group has a staff of 162 employees, um, some a fleet of 80 vehicles, and they meet the needs of not only tours but uh, high-end transportation throughout um, the country. So I would like you to join me. Please. Oh, also, I, I should mention that um, they've been recognized by the J.D. Power Awards Group. They have won. Um, uh, ho the Caribbean Hotel and Training Association Awards for Good Human Relations Practices. Uh, uh, they've given, as I mentioned, a staff complement of 162, and they're celebrated as an industry where exceptional hospitality is the norm. They have won awards throughout the Caribbean. They are Carnival Cruise Lines, car um, best tour provider in the Caribbean. Um, also, and Michael is very quiet on this point, about the amount of civic involvement that they um, contribute towards the development of the country. So for motivation, please join me in welcoming our second nominee, Mr. Michael Simonet. Passion, the third element that I speak about, Mr. Wendell Jones. And being a formidable force in the print, radio, and television media for some two decades, I can justifiably say that he is a man who needs no introduction. However, I wish to speak to you about his passion for the print, radio, and television media, because it's the same passion that has driven him to forge new ground in the Bahamian media landscape. New ground founded in core ideals of educating his audience to have meaningful conversations on the governance of the Bahamas. 
conversations that are devoid of elements like populism and e emotion. He is of the opinion that these elements have very negative implications for our future and that we too readily embrace them to our detriment. Indeed, he says he sees the major vision and mission of his group of companies as being a driving force in the healthy collective conversations that influence how we govern ourselves. As such, his group of companies will have an important role to play in the development of the Bahamas. Please join me in welcoming our third nominee for the Entrepreneurship Award, Mr. Wendell Jones. I must say that uh, on selecting the nominees, the Institute sat with each of them for a couple of hours, interviewing them, speaking about what drives them, what led them to um, those particular industries, uh, what are some of the challenges that they experienced, how did they overcome those by going over, under, around, or through. And it became very difficult to pick a particular winner because each of them are in different industries, each of them have had, had to face different hurdles and challenges. And after some deliberation, the Institute decided that we would award three <laughs> awards for this year. <laughs> so, I would, I would like to invite the nominees to join me and um, give a brief reply response to um, the awards. Um, perhaps if we can have the three nominees up and we'll take some photographs. Mr. Jones. Perhaps I'll, yeah, we'll um, present the awards for and take a photo off. We'd now like to invite Mr. Jones for a brief response. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. I'd like to uh, thank the Nassau Institute for this wonderful, uh, this very handsome award that uh, was presented me this evening. I know that I have arrived now, uh, that I have been presented this award by the Institute, because I know that um, the Institute goes about its business with a tremendous amount of study uh, and has been working hard and looking through the community and doing their work unscrupulously. Over the last 
two and a half decades, we in the Jones Communications Group, uh, we have tried to serve our public to the best of our abilities. And it is always good to know that your work is being noticed and appreciated uh, by the community. And so uh, when I was invited to lunch with the group, uh, I thought, well, you know, why us or why me? And then when I saw who uh, the other nominees were, I thought, well, you know, um, I'm in the big leagues now <laughs> uh, with Peter and Michael and others. Uh, and so uh, it is only left for me to, to say that we are going to endeavor in the ensuing years to seek to build a media organization uh, that can make Bahamians proud uh, so that we can be a regional leader in the production and presentation of news and current affairs programs, and so that we would better educate the citizens of the Bahamas, and we would be able also, by so doing, to improve the quality of life uh, in this country. And so once again, thank you so very much for this award this evening. Good evening, everybody. Thank you very much. Um, I don't quite know what to say. I didn't have anything prepared. I, I did some research before, and Wendell's building's bigger than mine, and um, <laughs> M M Michael has more buses than I do, and I thought, anyway, um, I, I will add this, that I think it is extremely difficult in a small country like we have when you're trying to give an award out um, and you have nomina nominees, it's very, very difficult to pick a winner because of we all do a little bit of everything in this country. So I'm very proud that I won with these two other gentlemen, but I am very honored that I was a, a nominee because I think that that's a case where they're sitting around a table and they're talking about who in the world, in the business world, can we uh, attract, and it's a more to me, it was a more genuine invitation to be a nominee. Um, I am disappointed that I wasn't the single winner because <clears throat> <laughs> what you all don't know that is not in my CV is that my wife, who is a partner at AdWorks, won without any co-winners. <laughs> the entrepreneur of the year by the chamber, I think it was, um, many, many, many moons ago. And um, I've been trying to play catch up since then. But um, I'm a very proud Bahamian. I'm proud of the sign man and the people that make it up. Um, we really do uh, the best that we can. And I just appreciate what the Institute is doing because I hate the government too. Um, <laughs> Uh, so thank you all very, very much. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, members of the Institute, I'm accustomed to going last. As a matter of fact, I thought they had a pretty good order tonight on the people who really deserved this nominee. I mean, this award, Mr. Jones and Mr. Bates, my two very good friends. But what I'd like to tell you was my history with the NASA Institute goes back many, many years. Um, the late Chester Thompson once introduced me to his lovely wife at that time, Joan Thompson, who I found out later was the founder of the NASA Institute. She introduced me to a guy I used to live next to and couldn't get along with by the name of Ralph Massey. We argued 
every evening after work for years and years about the educational system in the Bahamas, about economic empowerment and so on. He was a graduate at the University of Chicago and I came out of Minnesota and I thought that, you know, I might have been a little bit smarter than him, but alas, he turned out to be much, much smarter than I was. So, be that as it may, John introduced me to a young little uh, whippersnapper by the name of Rick Lowe at that time. And we never agreed on too many things, but especially how um, government ought to be run, you know, and their interference in our daily lives. But on most things we agree with is that uh, government gets too involved in our lives. So on that note, I wanted to uh, thank Rick for um, um, having those thoughtful, very introspective uh, discussions, and not that we agree on too many things, but uh, one thing we agreed on was uh, entrepreneurship. Entrepreneurship, um, as I think um, a speaker alluded to earlier, is one where one is prepared to take a risk. That risk is knowing on Friday you might not have a salary, but you have to pay your staff. And the challenge with that is, um, I think, which is something that um, I share with my fellow awardees here tonight, that um, they've done well for many, many years, and we're very proud of them, and I feel quite humbled to even be in this esteemed company. But I would like to say that um, our business is one where we had to pull up our socks. We pull up our socks in terms of when we started out with one employee and one vehicle. Then we went on and we added a second employee and a second vehicle. And the future is in the prize that comes out that most of our clients today are major clients. Um, and we're very, very flattered by either. I've walked into our doors and we didn't have to solicit them. And I think that's a standard that I give to 162 Bahamian staff, uh, well, sorry, 161 Bahamian staff, and it's up to them that they show they can provide world-class service, and that we're very proud of. And I think if that extends to the different industries in the Bahamas today, I think that we'll have the best little country in the world. And I thank you for listening to me, and I appreciate it, and thank you very much. Gentlemen, thank you very much. And uh, the Nassau Institute is certainly proud to celebrate with you. Uh, it's proud to have the opportunity to celebrate entrepreneurs in this country. Um, entrepreneurship and small and medium businesses, it's something that has garnered a lot of rhetoric over the years. Um, we're proud to be able to be uh, an organization that's actually doing something to hold you up to say, here are people that uh, we need to emulate. You, you're certainly a role models, uh, and there are so very many Bahamians out there with so very many ideas that are still born because the environment within which we exist is so very anti-business development. Whenever you pick up the newspapers, you see there are problems with the ease of doing business and where the Bahamas is ranked so lowly on so many scales. So. Thank you very much for your success, your, your ardent uh, motivation, your passion, um, the risks that you've taken, and congratulations. Be well and do well. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to request, there was a heck of a lot of information in this little booklet about our nominees and our winners that is very important to read to understand their, their journey. Um, it's all very interesting and, and thank you gentlemen for accepting and we, we sincerely appreciate what you have done and, and respect much of what you have done, it's incredible. Sitting at lunch uh, with you guys was amazing and um, I was honored to partake in that and thank you again for for what you've done. The, it is my pleasure to introduce our speaker tonight. Professor Klein, one of our board members, George Borlandelli, uh, 
introduced us to Dr. Klein. We were doing a series last year on entrepreneurship. Some of you are familiar faces that were here at one of the presentations at, and also at College of the Bahamas and then University of the Bahamas. But, you know, we call professors in universities in the U.S. or drop them an email. And surprisingly enough, they respond, particularly in the winter months, to come to the Bahamas to speak. And they'd never heard of this little fledgling organization, and we're, we're, we're proud to claim some very interesting speakers. And Dr. Klein was here last year, and uh, we're honored to have him back. But I want to introduce him. The theme of this lecture explores the role of big business in society, contrasting the views of Ayn Rand, Murray Rothbard, Alfred Chandler, Joseph Schumpeter, and other influential thinkers. It looks critically at the ways the government intervention affects how firms are structured, managed, and governed, and calls for market forces, not politics, to keep large firms in check. So a little bit about Dr. Klein. Peter G. Klein is the W.W. Carruth Chair and Professor of Entrepreneurship at Baylor University's Han I always screw this up. Hankammer School of Business, Senior Research Fellow at the Boss Center for Entrepreneurship and Free Enterprise, and the Carl Menger Research Fellow at the Mises Institute. He is author and editor of five books, and author of over 100 published articles, chapters, and reviews. His 2012 book, Organizing Entrepreneurial Judgment with Nikolai Foss, Cambridge University Press, won the 2014 Foundation for Economic Education Best Book Prize, and his 2010 book, The Capitalist and the Entrepreneur, for the Mises Institute, has been translated into Chinese and Portuguese. He received his PhD in economics from the University of California, Berkeley, and a BA in economics from the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. He has held faculty positions at the University of Missouri, the Copenhagen Business School, the University of Georgia, and Washington University in St. Louis. He was a senior economist for the Council of Economic Advisors in 2000 and 2001. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Peter G. Klein. Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be back here uh, in Nassau with my good friends uh, at the Nassau Institute. And um, I'm humbled to be uh, sharing the program tonight with these three distinguished entrepreneurs. You know, as someone who, who studies entrepreneurship and teaches and writes about entrepreneurship, you know, it, it, listening to me is okay, but listening to real entrepreneurs uh, is something else. Although I have to say I was a little disappointed by uh, Peter Bates's remark about hating the government because usually that's my line. I mean, I was, I was going to say that later and he's kind of stolen it from me, but I think I can come up with something else. Um, my, my talk tonight is on big business. And you might be wondering, well, why have a talk on big business at a meeting honoring entrepreneurs? Well, obviously, uh, large businesses and small and medium-sized businesses interact in many ways, right? They, they operate together in markets. They often partner with each other. They compete with each other. So certainly, uh, entrepreneurs are very interested in what, uh, what uh, large companies are doing. And even more important, don't forget that every large business started out as a smaller business, right? Firms of all sizes are created by entrepreneurs, uh, they're grown by entrepreneurs, and they're managed by entrepreneurs. And I think, uh, you know, as, as we try to understand some of the issues associated with larger companies and uh, their interaction with, with politics, as well as with the market, it helps us to appreciate the role of the entrepreneur uh, even more strongly. So, um, you know, there's so much that we could say about large companies and about, you know, big business, the, the term, right? When you hear the term big business, many people, when they hear the term big business, you know, that term is usually not used in a very flattering way, right? It's often used as a sort of a pejorative, right? Well, you know, big business doesn't care about the little guy or society or the environment 
or uh, overall well-being or what have you. So, you know, most people would, uh, or many people, uh, would identify big business as a foe, a foe to all that's good. Yet, uh, certainly many writers in the, in the classical liberal or libertarian tradition have said many positive things about big business. So, you know, how should we, within the community uh, represented here at the Nassau Institute, how should we regard big business? Is big business friend or foe? Well, you know, on the foe side, uh, like in your country, we have lots of public figures who tend to say things that are not very complimentary towards business of any kind, right? Like Senator Warren, for example. You can see Senator Sanders in the background, uh, the only openly socialist uh, member of the Senate. Of course, we have many de facto socialist <laughs> members of the Senate in the U.S. He's the only one who proudly goes by that term. Or you may remember uh, a few years ago, there was a famous incident where President Obama was referring to uh, the role of government in helping entrepreneurs. And you, you might remember this line. He said, you know, if, you, if you've got a business, if you started a business, you didn't build that, right? Somebody else made that happen. Now, to be fair, what he meant was, you know, nobody does it alone, right? Entrepreneurs have support systems. I mean, that's completely uncontroversial, right? But in the context of the particular speech that he was giving, right, he was giving uh, a call for more activist government policy to shape the economy, to steer the business landscape, and so on. And he was reacting explicitly to the kind of, you know, heroic entrepreneur talk that we've heard tonight, right? If, if the president, uh, former president were here tonight, he might, he might bristle a little bit at the glowing uh, characterizations of our three award winners tonight and say, oh, well, that makes it sound like these were heroic individuals who, against all odds, you know, established these companies and built them up. But really, it was all of us. It was, it was society that's responsible for those ventures. Well, we didn't ask our three uh, winners, but we could ask them to come up and, and say if they feel like society was responsible uh, for all their successes and failures. But, you know, it's a little bit uh, echoing of a, uh, an infamous um, uh, idea associated with, uh, with uh, Hillary Clinton, well, this, the, the name of one of her books, right? It takes a village to raise a child. And, of course, yeah, in, in the broad sense, we all live as part of a community, and it takes strong community ties. It takes a certain kind of a culture and so forth to foster, well, you know, to, to, to raise healthy children. And, of course, entrepreneurs want to be part of a community in which entrepreneurship is respected and supported. But I don't really think that's what Mrs. Clinton meant with that particular remark. Now, it could be worse. You know, in, in the UK, you may have a future prime minister who's bosom, bosom buddies with uh, Mr. Chavez and speaks openly about his admiration for Karl Marx and um, uh, other notorious figures in history. But, you know, in the US, right, for the last, what, year, almost year and a half, we've had a businessman as the president. Now, that kind of evokes strong reactions. Of course, Mr. Trump himself evokes a lot of strong reactions. But, you know, e even if Trump weren't so Trumpy, if I can say that, um, the mere fact that he, you know, had no political experience whatsoever, had never been elected to any office, but was, what, uh, a real estate developer, which, you know, is not the most respected kind of entrepreneur in the first place, uh, you know, a reality TV star, public figure, but, you know, clearly a very different kind of a background than, than the typical executive in a mature political system. So just the mere fact that a businessman could be president, well, in some quarters, that was, uh, that was taken very well, right? It's about time we had somebody who knows how to hire and fire people and knows how to make tough decisions instead of those, you know, instead of lawyers and professors and career politicians. On the other hand, to those who take a less favorable view of business in society, a businessman at the helm sounds like a very frightening thing. You know, why is that? Well, we could blame, we could blame the media, we could blame Hollywood, and, and say that, look, we all know that business people do not typically uh, you know, have a very po positive image in popular culture, right? I mean, you know, even The Economist, which is hardly a, you know, a, a pro-market ideological 
magazine, you know, noted in an article a couple of years ago how, you know, the, the most common category, the most common sort of j job description or occupation of any big, you know, Hollywood villain is a businessman or businesswoman, right? Mr. Potter in uh, the famous Frank, Frank, Frank Capra film, It's a Wonderful Life, or uh, the Michael Douglas character in Wall Street, uh, one of, you know, some of the Bond villains, the m more recent James Bond movies, and I was glad to hear uh, that uh, you were involved in the filming of one of those classic Bond movies back in the, was that back in the 60s or 70s, I'm guessing. You know, the more recent Bond films often have business people as, as villains, you know, the, the snidely whiplash type. That's sort of the image of the business person, large or small, in popular culture. I mean, things are a little bit different today, I think. And, you know, in studying entrepreneurship and talking to young people about, not only about becoming entrepreneurs, but just about the phenomenon of entrepreneurship in our society, you know, it's a little bit more difficult to play, to, to portray business people, to portray entrepreneurs as villains than it might have been in ages past. You know, because the, the, the big businessmen and big business women of today are not people like John D. Rockefeller, right, who are producing oil. Well, oil is dirty and, you know, you wouldn't want to touch it or smell it or be around it, right? Or, or Andrew Carnegie and steel or, you know, railroads or, again, noisy and dirty. Those are not sort of sexy industries to be in. But, you know, these are not the big businesses of today, right? Who are the big businesses of today? Apple, Amazon, Google, right? In China, Alibaba is, is, uh, is as big as these companies in the West. You know, so the world's largest companies, the world's largest companies for the last couple of years, you know, Apple and Alphabet, the parent company of Google, have been trading places as world's largest company by market capitalization. Right? It's not ExxonMobil. Um, it's not you know General Motors. It's not a bank. You know, it's companies whose products and services generally have a positive image among consumers. Right? You know, especially millennials. Uh, I don't know if it's the same here at the University of Bahamas, but uh, uh, millennials love Apple products. They love iPhones and they love Mac computers and iTunes and so forth, even though they're expensive. Um, I don't know how large a footprint Amazon has uh, here in the Bahamas. I'll say a little bit more about Amazon later. But uh, you know, in the US, of course, Amazon is now by far the largest retailer, greatly surpassing Walmart. I'll show you some data on that in just a moment. And you know, sometimes you, you hear academics and even policymakers say, well, you know, companies like Apple, and Amazon, they're too big, they're too powerful, maybe we need to treat them like standard oil 150 years ago, we need to apply antitrust rules and break them up. Oh, by the way, hold on, I gotta, I gotta uh, uh, check and make sure my movie downloaded. And oh, you know what, I gotta rush home and I, I gotta order my stuff on Amazon now. I mean, everybody loves Amazon. Almost everybody loves Amazon. Reminds me of um, uh, a company like Uber, Right, Uber is, is more controversial because, you know, there are people who don't, don't like the way Uber does business, but uh, if you've ever been in a city where Uber is active, you know how much better, how much easier it is to use and how much, you know, it's far superior to con the uh, conventional taxis. And uh, a friend of mine, a, a Parisian friend of mine, we were talking about uh, the fact that Uber is very strong in Paris. And as you know, in many cities around the world, Companies like Uber and, and, and other ride-sharing firms have been, uh, ha, ha, there have been very strong protests by the taxi lobby against ride-sharing companies where taxi drivers will stage, uh, will have boycotts and strikes and they'll blockade the streets with their cabs and so forth. Well, that's exactly the kind of thing that French people do all the time. I mean, they have more strikes in France than, you know, in Karl Marx's wildest dream or labor strikes. Uh, so I asked this friend, well, how was Uber able to thrive in, in France, especially in Paris, where the, ta where the taxi unions are so strong? And he said, well, the French politicians, they love Uber, right? They hate ha getting a cab. They think the French taxi drivers are terrible, and they love being able to ride in an Uber. So they allowed their own, uh, the, the, this, this personal experience to override whatever ideological leanings they may have had to support the taxi unions. Right? So my point is these companies are a little harder to hate 
than a, than, a, than a railroad or a factory that's belching smoke into the sky. So, you know, how should we think about these big companies? What's the right approach to understanding them? What's a sort of a, a free market approach to understanding big business? Well, the first point to be made, and it's really a pretty obvious point, but one that is often lost in these kinds of conversations, is that big businesses, even the most vilified ones in history, have provided massive, massive benefits to ordinary people. So uh, my, my friends who are professors here at the university, I'm sure will, will confirm that if you look in many of the textbooks, you know, somebody like John D. Rockefeller, you know, how is he portrayed in the textbooks? Oh, a very, very bad man because, you know, he started this oil company and he drove all his rivals out of business by pricing his products so low that they couldn't compete. He gobbled them up and he became this monopolist dominating the oil industry. Well, I mean, how did Rockefeller become so wealthy? I mean, to whom was he selling that oil, or rather the products that were made from the petroleum that his companies were digging out of the ground? You know, he wasn't selling his products to Andrew Carnegie or his fellow, you know, plutocrats. He was selling it to ordinary folks. Right? If you look at prices of fuel, you see a dramatic decrease in fuel prices throughout the time of Standard Oil. You know, it's easy to forget that before entrepreneurs like John D. Rockefeller, most people in, in, in the world, and even in uh, places like the United States, you know, their day ended when the sun went down. When the sun went down, you went inside and went to bed. Because, you know, it's funny, when you watch old movies, you watch movies about the Middle Ages or ancient Rome or something, and you know, the rooms are, all, are always brightly lit because they have candles all over the place. You know, that's extremely historically inaccurate because candles were very, very expensive. And you know, only the wealthy could afford more than a few candles. And you certainly wouldn't stay up all night you know, with illuminating your whole home with candles. No, when, when the sun went down, people went to bed and they got up when the sun went up because there was no practical way to provide light. But thanks to men like John D. Rockefeller, right? The prices of petroleum plummeted, so the prices of heating oil and uh, oil for kerosene lamps fell by several orders of magnitude, so that everyone, even the poor, could now afford to have a kerosene lamp. Okay, so families, you know, not wealthy families, but middle class and working class families could now stay up at night and read to their children and productivity increased and so forth. So men like John D. Rockefeller were greatly improving the quality of life, not for wealthy people, but for ordinary people, especially the least well off in society. I mean, look at Walmart, All right? Lots of people in the US dislike Walmart, usually wealthy intellectuals in Boston or New York or San Francisco, you know, they're, so they're, they're typing out an article about how evil Walmart is, you know, on their iPhone while they're picking up dinner at Whole Foods on the way home to their expensive condominium. And people say, oh, well, you know, Walmart is so big, it dominates conventional retail. And, you know, when a Walmart sets up in town, it drives out of business all the mom and pop stores. And that is terrible. It's, it's terrible what Walmart has done. It's destroyed small towns all across America. It's destroyed the downtown of small towns because small merchants can't compete with a behemoth like Walmart. Now look, if you own a mom and pop retail store in a small town and a Walmart opens up you know, somewhere nearby, to be sure that is likely to put a put a serious dent in your, uh, in your fortunes. It is very difficult for small merchants to compete with Walmart, and of course I have great empathy for the small merchant who is unable to compete. I mean, there's no denying that. However, you've got to balance that side of the ledger with the tremendous benefits that accrue not to Walmart's competitors, but to Walmart's workers and Walmart's customers. Okay? Why do, why, when a Walmart opens up in town, why they never have any problem filling the employment roles. Why? Because Walmart is a great place, place to work compared to the alternatives in many of the places where Walmart 
operates. And again, who is shopping at Walmart? Not the anti-business intellectuals, you know, with their copy of Das Kapital under their arm. It's working class people, right? In fact, you know, Walmart, their, their, their tagline is, what is it, uh, save money, live better? I think is their, their tagline. I mean, that is really, a, a, that's a genius tagline, right? Because, yeah, wall, low prices, oh, how romantic is that? Well, I mean, the fact that you can get so many things so inexpensively at Walmart, it allows your dollar to go much farther than it did before, okay? And if you have limited dollars to spend, having a Walmart nearby and the downward pressure that Walmart puts on prices of other stores makes you much, much better off than you would be before. And I mean, I don't even have to say anything about, you know, search engines like Google, right? Imagine your life without Google. You know, the gray-haired folks in the room, I see some young people who are sort of struggling to process, what am I talking about, right? But there was a time when if you wanted information, you had to like, physically move to a library, or you had to make a telephone call, or pick up, you know, these things, these big things with sheets of paper, we used to call them books. Um, and, you know, by the way, I, I, I was just looking for an image to put on my slide, and I'm not even sure what language this is, but, you know, Google makes its services available to people all over the world in hundreds, dozens, maybe hundreds of languages. And so imagine how people in those parts of the world, imagine how much more access to information they had than before. Again, who is the consumer of the products of a company like Google? Not the wealthy, right? It's all of us, including those who are the least well off. Okay. Um, so let me suggest that if we want to analyze big business, the wrong question is, well, how big are we talking about? In other words, well, somebody might say, well, I'm, I'm in favor of business. I'm pro-entrepreneur. I like business. But it just can't be too big. If it gets really big or if it makes a lot of money, big profits, or if it grows really fast, well, then, then I'm suspicious, right? That could be a problem. I mean... Look at a company like Amazon, right? These are actually data from 2013 when Amazon's uh, uh, gross sales were almost 70 billion U.S. dollars, much, much more than, I mean, look at Walmart in fourth place there. So Walmart is the world's largest conventional retailer, but Amazon is a much, much larger retailer. Um, and, and I looked it up for 2017, the figure is 178 billion. So, oh, well, gosh, any company that's that large must be doing great harm to society. Well, I mean, would you, would you be better off if Amazon weren't around? Would you prefer a world in which you could not order all the things that you order from Amazon? And, of course, some of Amazon's sales, it's, Amazon is not just a provider of uh, goods and services, but Amazon also provides uh, web services, uh, you know, back-end operations that most that we consumers don't experience directly but how many people like to watch Netflix so Netflix has most of its content on Amazon servers Amazon web services so Amazon is providing uh, creating huge amounts of value for society now capturing a lot of value as well because it's a highly profitable company and uh, CEO Jeff Bezos is now the world's largest sorry world's wealthiest man and as I understand in at least in nominal terms, the wealthiest person who has ever lived in human history. It's not bad, right? It's, it's not a bad living. Um, but I, I would never think that Jeff Bezos has acquired that wealth at my expense in a way that does me any harm. On the contrary, he acquired that wealth by making me much, much, much better off than I otherwise would have been. What about growth? Well, one of the phenomena of, you know, the, the modern economy or the new economy is the very rapid pace of adoption. I, I saw this chart on social media a few weeks ago, and I haven't looked at the numbers, but, you know, it was on the Internet, so it must be true. 
I'm just assuming that these numbers are right because it makes for an interesting story that if you look at different technologies, or this is a chart, this is the number of years it took for each of these products to gain 50 million users. And so for commercial aviation, it took 68 years before that, from the founding of birth of that industry to when it was serving 50 million uh, customers. And for television, it only took 22 years. And for the, the web, it took only seven years. And for Facebook, it was only three years. And Twitter, it only took two years to reach 50 million users. Can you guess what the last one's going to be? Pokemon Go. <laughs> Pokemon Go took only 19 days to reach 50 million users. I mean, look. Was, you know, do, do, do these comp, do, you know, video game companies, Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, iPods, wireless phones. I mean, are, are we concerned that the providers of some of these goods and services grew very rapidly? No, I don't think so. Right? Growth, there's nothing wrong with growth per se. What about, you know, market share? Many people say, well, the issue is not how large a firm is or how quickly it became large, but, to, but, but, but how many competitors it has. What, what we really ought to be worried about is market share. If a firm has a very large market share, then it can dominate, it can, it can raise prices and keep other firms out, and that is hurtful to innovation, and it can reduce consumer well-being and so forth. Well, I mean, look at some examples. Here's Google's market share in search. Now, this is just, uh, this, this chart only reflects search on mobile devices. So you can see, uh, uh, what is the percentage? I can't even see it here, 84%. So more than 80% of all uh, web searches from a mobile device use Google, and there are, you know, only a few use Yahoo or Bing or whatever. Um, you know, is that harmful? Well, I mean, look, I myself, when I am interested in finding information, I will some, of course I, of course I Google it like you do, right? Google is the only one of these that is a verb. <laughs> You never hear someone say, well, let me bing that for you. You know, you wouldn't understand what that means. But there are other search engines out there, and there's nothing whatsoever preventing me from using one of these other search engines. And sometimes I do, right? If I don't find exactly what I want on Google, sometimes I'll look at Bing or Yahoo Search or one of these others to see what I can find. And as most of you know, when you get a new uh, mobile device or a, a, a tablet or something, you know, often there's a choice, you know, what do you want the default search engine to be? There's no law that compels you to make it Google, right? People typically default to Google because it's better, right? It's better. Lots of people like Facebook. Um, is it bad that so many people like Facebook? Well, um, you know, in the last few weeks and months, we've heard a lot in the U.S., I don't know how much you've heard it here, about, you know, so-called fake news and you know, the Russians were manipulating ads on Facebook to get people to vote for Trump instead of Clinton. I mean, all this is, you know, highly speculative. But it's very hard for me to see that even if it were true that Facebook were, you know, influencing people in, in, in particular ways, that, uh, you know, that that is any different from any other form of influence, such as in the traditional media, right? The, I mean, many critics of social media have in mind a world, kind of an imaginary world, well, in which there's nothing out there but facts. Right? Facebook and Twitter and so forth, you know, they keep pushing uh, articles that are not, that are not correct. They, they don't separate fact and opinion. Well, I mean, what, how do you know that it's fact? Just because it appeared in the New York Times or the Washington Post. Now, I'm sure if it, if it was in one of your publications, it is factual. <laughs> but <laughs> I'm, I'm counting on, uh, uh, you know, some good press for this talk. And, <laughs> and Michael and I are going to talk about, about tourism later, about my personal tourism. Um, but, uh, no, I mean, look, 
it, 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 it's extremely naive to imagine that if it weren't for social media, people would have a much more factual view of the world. I mean, that's not how, that's not how information flows work. And of course, there's nothing compelling me or you or any of us to, to adopt or stick to any particular social media platform. I sometimes show my students an article that I found that was published in 2008, and it was called, uh, well, oh, I forget the exact title, but something like, you know, can anyone ever displace MySpace? How many people remember what MySpace is? MySpace was Facebook before Facebook. Can MySpace ever be beaten? And of course now it's, it's gone. So 10 years from now, Facebook might very well be gone. Uh, here's Netflix, right? In the streaming, sort of streaming commercial uh, video market, it's not quite as concentrated, but again, you have a few large players, right? You've got Netflix, YouTube, Hulu, and Amazon as kind of the four dominant firms. As I mentioned, it's sort of interesting that uh, Netflix is actually using Amazon servers to deliver its content. So, you know, the college students here who've taken an economics course might say, oh, well, Google's got a monopoly, and in streaming video, you have an oligopoly and that's bad and the government should do something about it. I mean, seriously, can you, can you imagine something that the government could do that would make your online browsing and media consumption habits and enjoyment greater? I can't, I, I, mean, I can't imagine what they could do. If that's the wrong question, what's the right question? If how big, how fast did you grow? How concentrated is your market? If that's the wrong question, what's the right question? I would say it's this one. How did big business X get big? Did it get big by pleasing its customers? By delivering products and services that are preferred by consumers to other products and services that are available? Or did it get big because of some special privilege granted to it by the political system. Right, that's your big business friend or foe in a nutshell right there. Okay, firms that are large because they satisfy the consumer better than the alternatives. Uh, those firms I applaud. But I do recognize it certainly is true that there are cases where companies can become large not because they please the consumer, but because of some kind of special deal, some kind of backroom favors, some kind of special arrangement. Excuse me? Oh, that would never happen in the Bahamas, I know. It's only in, company, it's only in countries with high levels of corruption like the United States. Now, it's interesting. Um, uh, Ayn Rand d delivered a lecture, I think, in 1963 that was later published as a, in a, as a chapter in a book and as a pamphlet called America's Persecuted Min Minority, Big Business. Right? And she was really referring to the sort of stuff I was talking about before, the portrayal of business people in the media, uh, in Hollywood, by politicians and so forth. And she certainly is right that business people and large companies in particular have this very negative opinion, as I, as I mentioned earlier. But within the kind of free market community, uh, there, there, there's actually a variety of views on how, in fact, in particular countries, particular times and places, the typical big company becomes big. Right? So there are a lot of people, uh, a, a lot of scholars, uh, sort of free market scholars, who have been influenced by writers such as Gabriel Kolko, uh, sort of a left-wing historian who wrote about, uh, among other industries, the railroad industry in the United States, and showed that, in fact, in the 19th century and early 20th century, there were many, many government policies, even ones that were, that were described as sort of progressive policies, that really were operating in the interests of particular politically connected companies, rather than working in the interests of the people, you know, against big companies. There was a book edited by Murray Rothbard and Ronald Radosh called A New History of Leviathan that has, uh, contains some classic essays on this uh, phenomenon, both from a kind of a left-wing and from a free market libertarian 
point of view. Uh, Murray Rothbard actually, uh, j just I think in the last year, uh, the Mises Institute published a new book by Murray Rothbard who passed away in 1995, but among his papers uh, were discovered several completed manuscripts that had never been published. And you can now get this book at, Mises dot, at the Mises Institute uh, on the progressive era. And Rothbard very much takes the view that much progressive era legislation in the US, which was sold to the public as you know, tactics for curbing the influence of big companies like Standard Oil and Carnegie Steel and so forth, that these policies were really doing exactly the opposite. They were benefiting certain companies at the expense of others. I was once looking through some of Rothbard's unpublished correspondence and came across the following quotation. Rothbard said uh, in, in a letter in 1966 to a friend, he said, for some time I've come to the conclusion that the grave, dif uh, that the grave deficiency in the current output and thinking of our libertarians and classical liberals is an enormous blind spot when it comes to big business. He said, while big, big business would indeed merit praise if they won that bigness on the purely free market, in the contemporary world, now again, he's writing in the mid-1960s in the United States. So he calls that the contemporary world of total neo-mercantilism, i.e. a government that is very actively involved in almost all industries, right? And uh, what is essentially a neo-fascist corporate state Bigness is a priori highly suspect because big business most likely got that way through an intricate and decisive network of subsidies, privileges, and direct and indirect grants of monopoly protection. So Ayn Rand offers a very strong view from a free market position in favor of big business. And Rothbard, writing in the 1960s, took a very opposite interpretation of how most American companies in the 20th century had gotten big, but again, from a free market kind of libertarian perspective. Now, I don't think Rothbard's description applies entirely to our current world for reasons that I've just shown you, right? Because some of the really big companies today are these big tech companies that I think did not achieve their status through subsidy and privilege and protection. But there certainly are Plenty of firms like that. There are plenty of crony capitalists out there. Right here at tonight's uh, banquet, we honored three virtuous capitalists. But the world is also full of crony capitalists as well. Um, so what, let me give you some examples. Well, one thing that government does to help foster not the good kind of capitalism, but the crony kind, is handouts. The government gives lots of handouts, right? If you've been watching the news in the last few uh, weeks, you know that uh, Elon Musk's SpaceX company sent a rocket up into high orbit with a Tesla Roadster in it. Maybe you've seen the pictures of the sports car now cir circling the Earth. I'm sorry, but Elon Musk has a business model that depends very heavily on exploiting government subsidies. All of the businesses that he is in today, Tesla, SpaceX, SolarCity, these are all businesses in which uh, government intervention plays a substantial role. Uh, solar panels are subsidized uh, uh, by the US taxpayer. The electric car industry receives enormous uh, financial and other benefits from the US government. And SpaceX is, uh, the, the US taxpayer is paying a lot of the expense for launching those private rockets. Now, I do want to say, if, if, if you do some research on your own about uh, Elon Musk and getting government subsidies, you know, in, in the mainstream media, the word subsidy is often used to describe two very different things. One is you know, handouts. The government gives you cash, or the government gives you a, a subsidized loan, or the government gives you a piece of valuable property, or the government builds a bunch of roads or builds an airport just for you at taxpayer expense. Those are handouts. In, in the mainstream media, they also describe uh, tax breaks as a kind of subsidy. Now, I personally am OK with that kind of subsidy. I would prefer that we all got the tax break. But giving a tax break to one company is better than giving a tax break to nobody. 
Okay, so I'm, I'm not as critical of Elon Musk for taking advantage of tax rebates or tax discounts, but I am critical of his acceptance of billions of dollars of taxpayer cash directly and indirectly. Or how about a company like Goldman Sachs? I mean, I sometimes joke that Goldman Sachs is like the fourth branch of the U.S. government, <laughs> right? Because, you know, it does so much business with the U.S. Treasury, and Goldman Sachs and a few other uh, investment banks are what uh, in, in New York they call primary dealers, meaning that whenever the Federal Reserve System, you know, the way the Fed expands the money supply, as you students know, is not just by turning on a printing press, but by buying and selling government securities, so-called open market operations. You know, the government doesn't buy and sell these securities I mean, in, a, in a transaction with me or you, we common folk are not, do not have the ability to purchase newly issued treasury bills and so forth. It's Goldman Sachs and a few other big investment banks like Goldman Sachs. Goldman Sachs. They're the ones who make huge amounts of money from trading government securities that only they are allowed to receive when they're initially sold uh, by the Fed. So, I mean, yeah, I'm sure Goldman Sachs would still be a large commercial entity even if it weren't heavily protected and given special benefits, but those special benefits have, uh, ha have helped Goldman Sachs a lot. And it's not a, a coincidence that in the U.S., you know, the best way to become Secretary of the Treasury is to be CEO of Goldman Sachs, and then you can rotate back to Goldman after you finish <laughs> being at the Treasury. How about the Export-Import Bank in the United States? There was talk that the Republicans were going to try to defund the Export-Import Bank, but that got, uh, that, that didn't happen. So, well, but I mean, isn't it a good thing that there's a government agency that tries to promote trade? It's good for the Bahamas and other economies that are dependent on a, the flow of goods and services from the U.S. But in fact, the Export-Import Bank is not there really to promote trade broadly. Um, if you look at the largest uh, recipients of Export-Import credits, right? So, the Export-Import Bank gives U.S. gives, gives uh, what they call export credits to buyers all around the world, especially in developing countries, so that they can buy U.S.-made goods and services. Okay, but nobody's getting an import-export bank loan to buy my services, you know, to pay me to come and give a speech or something, and you might be wondering after tonight why anyone would do that, but... Uh, the biggest recipients of the money that uh, comes from the Import-Export Bank are Boeing, Caterpillar, and GE. So the majority of these XM loans are given to governments in developing countries so that they can buy Boeing aircraft, civilian and defense, so that can, they can buy heavy equipment, construction equipment from Caterpillar, and so that they can buy industrial things from GE. Okay, so it's, the government is not quite putting cash in the hands of these companies' shareholders. It's just doing it through a little circle. The U.S. taxpayer gives money to the government in country X, which then buys a bunch of stuff from Boeing. Okay, so these, and of course the, uh, the uh, congressional delegation from the, from the state of Washington, where Boeing uh, is the largest employer and has been headquartered for many, many years, led the opposition to the defunding of the Export-Import Bank. Thank you. Uh, another phenomenon that I think is less, less obvious but equally important is what economists call raising rivals' costs. And what this means is there are many government policies that on the surface have nothing to do with well, with, with businesses at all, or, or, or helping or subsidizing some kinds of businesses, but in fact have exactly that kind of effect. So they benefit certain firms by increasing the costs of the rivals to those beneficiaries. So for example, it's very easy to see this with trade policy, right? So if the United States, for example, uh, slaps a big import tariff on steel that is imported from China into the United States. You know, it's not very hard to look at that and figure out, you know, well, who are the winners and losers, right? So obviously, shareholders of U.S. steel companies, 
people who work for U.S. steel companies are, are be they're, they're, they're better off as a result of that tariff because their jobs and their profits are protected from competition from cheap Chinese imports. Clearly, Chinese manufacturers and the people associated with them are worse off. But of course, the other party that's worth, worse off is U.S. consumers, right? Anyone who buys steel in the U.S. or buys any products made with steel in the U.S. now have to pay higher prices than they otherwise would. So everybody knows that a steel tariff in a country like the U.S is really a way of taking money out of the hands of U.S. consumers and putting it in the pockets of steel companies. Uh, you know, the U.S. has a sugar, sugar cane industry in Louisiana and in Florida. It's completely not competitive with the rest of the world's sugar industry. I don't know if you grow any sugar here in, uh, in the Bahamas, but the best place to grow sugar is Brazil. Brazil is the most efficient producer of cane sugar but we protect a small number of Louisiana and Florida sugarcane farmers with a huge tax, huge tariff on imported sugar. I mean, most, most people don't think about it, but if you did think about it, it wouldn't be hard to see that this is taking money out of the hands of U.S. sugar consumers and putting it in the pockets of a small number of U.S. sugar farmers. Uh, of course, and the point is, each of us, it's just taking a couple pennies out of my pocket but you take a couple pennies out of the pockets of 300 million consumers, and that adds up to a pretty big chunk to go into the pocket of, you know, 100 sugar farmers. What's maybe not as obvious but also important is that many health regulations, safety and environmental regulations also have the effect of, of protecting some firms at the expense of others. For example, uh, uh, about 20 years ago, under President George H.W. Bush, the Bush, the for, Bush 41, as opposed to Bush 43, uh, Bush 41 championed a piece of legislation called the Americans with Disabilities Act, which required U.S. businesses of all sizes to accommodate people with disabilities, which of course sounds like a, personal, uh, a perfectly reasonable thing to do. So, uh, I mean, you have it here in the Bahamas as well, but you you know, you have uh, bathrooms, uh, bathroom stalls that are larger that can accommodate people in wheelchairs. You have uh, reserved parking spaces uh, for, for people with disabilities. You have, you know, ramps instead of stairs and so forth, right? Ways to make buildings more accessible. I mean, who could possibly be opposed to something like that? Well, it turns out if you look at the lobbying history the lobbying that took place around that time, you saw a very interesting phenomenon. Uh, lobby groups representing small companies, representing small businesses, lobbied very heavily against the Americans with Disabilities Act. Uh, Disabilities Act. They said, well, it's gonna be very expensive for us to provide those accommodations and some of us are going to go out of business. We can't afford to redo our parking lot. We can't afford to install an elevator or a ramp. This is just simply, so, so we, it's very costly for us to comply with that law. Okay, well, that, that makes, that's not easy to understand. It turns out that the lobby groups representing the largest companies in the United States lobbied heavily in favor of the Americans with Disabilities Act. Now, does that mean that executives and shareholders of big companies are generous and kind-hearted and concerned with the well-being of others, whereas small business people are callous and uncaring and have no concern whatsoever for the disabled? No. It's that large companies knew that it was, it's no big deal for them to be compliant. Most of them were already compliant. They wanted to impose differential costs on their smaller and younger rivals. I mean, think about complex you know, kinds of uh, regulation and the tax code and so forth. Large companies have big staffs of attorneys and lawyers and accountants, some of whom do nothing but, you know, they have a, a bureau of regulatory affairs, they call it people who do nothing but liaise with the government. They make sure the firm is in compliance, they make sure all the taxes are paid, the regulations are met, the paperwork is filled out. If you're a large company, you can afford that. 
and you know your smaller rivals cannot. So you have an incentive to make the regulatory system more complicated. You don't want tax simplification. You want tax complification, okay? You want to make it, you want to, you want to make it difficult for firms to comply with regulation because you know that you can comply at a lower cost than your smaller and younger rivals. Uh, as the economist Bruce Yandels pointed out that when the uh, first major piece of environmental legislation was passed in the United States, the Clean Air Act of 1970, that this legislation was written in a way that it grandfathered in existing manufacturing facilities. So the Clean Air Act said any newly constructed plants must meet the following emission standards. They can only emit so much smoke and they're limited in how much they can pollute. All, this applies to all new construction. Can you imagine who would be in favor of a law like that? Anybody who's got a facility already. Okay, because it raised their rivals' costs. Okay, I'm going to skip my comment on bootleggers and Baptists. Um, I do want to point out that uh, I do want to point out that government also uh, there are many forms of government intervention that benefit smaller firms. So while government does things that help large firms at the expense of small, government also does many things in many countries to try to benefit small firms at the expense of larger ones. Right? I mean, antitrust law is a good example because you know very small companies that have a large market share, you know, somewhere on one of the less populated islands here in the Bahamas, if you have a, a, a little shop that is the only shop of its kind on the island, it's got 100% market share on that island, you know, the, the, the Bahamian antitrust authority is probably not going to pay them a lot of attention. Uh, if you're a little, again, a small town USA, merchant with a large market share, antitrust is not going to come after that merchant, but, a but if you're a large company, antitrust will come after you. So smaller companies can fly under the radar screen in some cases. There's also the phenomenon that the economist uh, Fred McChesney, late, the late Fred McChesney, called rent extraction. Rent extraction. And uh, he's got a very interesting book on this topic that I would recommend to you called Money for Nothing. Money for Nothing. It's a book about lobbying uh, of different sorts in the U.S. context. But McChesney's essential argument is that some of the things that government does are meant as a kind of intimidation tactic, as a way of signaling to wealthy companies that they need to make the politicians happy. And a good illustration of this phenomenon is the big antitrust case that was launched in the mid-1990s against Microsoft. So the US launched a multi-year campaign accusing Microsoft of various antitrust violations. And then the European Union also had a separate case against Microsoft. One of the interesting phenomena associated with this case is that before uh, the mid-90s, 1995 essentially, these, what were now becoming pretty big tech companies like Microsoft, uh, Apple, Oracle, these Silicon Valley and West Coast firms, they did not do, well, really any lobbying. Unlike, you know, GE and Boeing and these more established companies that had big lobbying operations. It was, it was observed by some politicians and journalists, much to, their, much to their horror, that Microsoft didn't even have a Washington, D.C. office. You've heard of what they call K Street, you know, it's where all these lobbyists are located in Washington. All the big companies have a Washington, D.C. staff whose job is, well, I'm not going to call it bribery. We call it lobbying, okay. <laughs> making campaign contributions and so forth, dealing with government officials. These big tech companies, they weren't giving politicians a dime. Well, who the heck do they think they are? <laughs> okay. After the Microsoft trial, 
You saw the tech companies set up huge Washington, D.C. outfits. And in the last election cycle, uh, Silicon Valley tech firms were huge supporters, mostly of, of, uh, of Senator Clinton, or Secretary Clinton. Um, but but the, the big tech companies are now, they're, they're big players on the D.C. circuit. And the, the McChesney's argument is that many of the things government does, are it's, it's a kind of extortion racket, essentially. The government will, you know, will, will, there will be antitrust pressure or politicians will talk about regulating a certain industry. And we were, I was talking to some of you about financial privacy rules and you know, this purported crackdown on tax havens like the Caymans and maybe the Bahamas as well. Uh, some of this is just talk, but it's designed to elicit a response, namely campaign contributions, lobbying expenditures, and other perks that go to the politicians, okay? Uh, you know, when, uh, during the last election, there was a big, uh, some people were unhappy that, uh, that, that former President Clinton and also his wife, Secretary Clinton, you know, had accepted you know, hundreds of millions of dollars in speaking fees to give talks at Goldman Sachs and other big companies. I don't know if you remember this. Uh, Senator Sanders really hammered on Secretary Clinton in the Democratic primaries that she's supposed to be a Democratic Party, she's supposed to be representing the left, and yet she's accepting millions of dollars in speaking fees from big companies, and the Clinton Foundation was taking money from all over the place. You know, I, I sometimes ask myself, you know, wh if, if, why would Goldman Sachs want Hillary Clinton to give a speech? I mean, whatever you think of Mrs. Clinton, she's not that charismatic, okay? <laughs> Now, I mean, Bill Clinton gives a sp good speech, to be sure, but I mean, why do people like the Clintons, why, when they're temporarily out of office, do they get put on so many corporate boards where they draw a nice salary? Do they get so many speaking invitations? Why are they getting all this money from big banks, big companies? Well, my hypothesis is people like Goldman Sachs and these other big companies are thinking, well, Hillary Clinton, she might be President Clinton next year, or the year after, wouldn't it be a good thing if we were on you know, favorable terms with her? If once she's in office, she, oh, I remember that wonderful night I had with Goldman Sachs and they gave me a million dollar check at the end, <laughs> right? You know, we could talk about other things like uh, the requirements for large firms to disclose their financial information. In the United States, we've seen a secular decrease in the number of listed companies, a sharp decrease in the number of IPOs. So there are a lot of firms that are preferring not to go onto the public stock markets to you know, use private equity or bank finance or whatever to stay small because they don't want to have to disclose everything, especially after the uh, uh, you know, Enron scandal. Now there's this, uh, what they call the Sarbanes-Oxley Act in the US uh, that, uh, and there's other legislation that makes, you know, corporate executives personally liable for any errors that are on the financial statements. And a lot of firms don't want to be big because they don't want to have to disclose, they don't want to be liable, and so forth. Um, of course, there are lots of subsidies. There are direct handouts to small companies, too. The U.S. has a small business administration. You have some of the same kind of thing here in the Bahamas, giving cash, giving subsidized loans. Uh, special grants, setting up business incubators and so forth, using taxpayer money to help smaller companies. You know, and you might even argue that um, most of what government does in the economy, trade barriers and, and waging war and having the state be in charge of education and so forth, that these make the economy less efficient than it otherwise would. They sort of, you know, they hold back the division of labor, they make it more expensive to do business than it otherwise would be, and that maybe in a pure, purely free economy, a lot of firms would be bigger than they are now. Okay, the government intervention just makes everything work less well, and it makes it more difficult for firms to scale up. Okay, so what's the bottom line? Big business can be, and in many cases is, a great friend, but politic Politically connected big business can be foes, can do great harm, right? So at the end of the day, what should we care about? In my opinion, not size or growth or market share per se, 
But the issue is, is the government intervening in a way that benefits some of us at the expense of others? And if government is helping certain businesses become big businesses, then that is a source of concern. Okay, whether that business be GE or Microsoft or a vendor down in the straw market, just a couple blocks from here, right? Any business that is, that is earning sales by satisfying its customers, whether it's large or small, is doing society a great service, and those are the businesses that we need to applaud. So thank you very much. Professor Klein, I, I gotta tell you, that was a very, very powerful presentation. I, uh, I was a little concerned when you started talking about Walmart. I wasn't sure if you were gonna get thrown out the window by some of the more active participants in that establishment. But if you take to heart some of the things that were said, you, you begin to appreciate the magnitude of what the Institute wants to put to our youth and to the Bahamas. And I think that presentation was an excellent one in that vein. Um, we do have an opportunity for Q&A. If there are any questions that anyone would have for Professor Klein beforehand, um, by any chance? First, sorry, first. Yes. Gentlemen, and then we'll go to the lady yeah. in the back, please. I think one point you might have made very clear was this. Every big business was once a small business. How did, how did it make the transition? It didn't make the transition usually by government help, but it made the transition by people and business being smarter than other people. No, you're exactly right. And there are two paths by which a small business can become large, and you just outlined the two paths. And we need to be concerned about efforts to make small businesses larger in ways that do harm to the taxpayer and to the citizen. But otherwise, of course, that's the goal of not all, but many small businesses to become large. Yeah, yes, ma'am. So what is your recommendation that small and medium-sized businesses, especially in a very insular economy like the Bahamas, where we're competing with these Amazons and well, maybe competing is the wrong word, we try and stay viable with these Amazons and we have such protectionist measures and government intervention and corruption, how does a small and medium-sized business sort of overcome that to remain viable? Well, it's a, it's a great question. I mean, I, I don't presume to have enough expertise in local political conditions to have anything particularly useful uh, to advise. But I mean, if we just sort of, just yeah, to kind yeah. of generalize the problem that you're talking about, I mean, there, there are two different things going on, right? One is if the political system, if the, you know, the tax code, the way the law is written and enforced, particular kinds of regulations, you know, if they are in fact protecting uh, large companies, whether they're domestic or foreign, at the expense of indigenous enterprise, well, that needs to be pointed out. It needs to be highlighted. That needs to be made clear. You know, find out in who's, who is, you know, who's sort of behind this kind of legislation. Are there special interests working behind the scenes to protect themselves and expose them? You know, to the sunlight, we have our friends in the media industry, maybe, who can help us with that. You know, I, I don't know what is the wisest political strategy in, in your country for bringing about some kind of social change. But, you know, the second issue is also kind of a more practical one. What do you do as the owner of a smaller, medium-sized enterprise trying to compete against the behemoths? I mean, usually the best strategy is not to try to compete, you know, head-to-head, -head but to find a niche to circumvent, you know, there, no matter how large or successful one of these companies, maybe foreign companies is, you know, there are always some holes or gaps. There are some local market needs that are not being satisfied. Sometimes, you know, local companies, indigenous, co indigenous companies have an advantage over foreign multinationals in understanding local market conditions, understanding the local culture, understanding the local buyer, and maybe understanding you know, the legal system and so forth better. So looking for those little, little niche margins on which you can compete effectively you know, is usually the best strategy than trying to compete sort of head to head. But of course, the devil is in the details as, as it always is. 
Yes, please. This gentleman here. Uh, yeah, I, I think uh, I, I very much enjoyed your presentation. I think the premise sets up a little bit uh, a black and white scenario, and the reality is, as you speak to it, it's, it's not that. And I think, though, there is a point to say that the, the size of an organization, the size of a corporation, uh, like anything large, when it moves, is going to have a larger impact on any environment. And, and I think within that, what you see is that, that some of the, the largest entities are doing some amazing, phenomenal things, the Gates, Gates Foundation, and what Google does in its space, and, and, and these types of things. But at the same time, it has to look at what happens and where it happens. So when a Walmart moves into a depressed area where industry has failed, it becomes a, a, a godsend because it, it reinvigorates. When it moves into an environment where there is some sustainable local economy, it decimates it. And, and there's an impact that needs to be understood to that. And I think that, that the, the truth is it's become a much more widely understood uh, part that that there is this importance of co-utility, that there is a, an essence of corporate social responsibility that comes within size, and through that, those entities can do much more on their scale than anybody else. And I think that it needs to be recognized, but also understood that they can also do more damage than any with, without. And, and, well, yeah. yeah, I mean, to be sure, uh, just as you said, the larger the footprint, the larger the impact, no matter what the particular actions are. I mean, I, I will say, um, you know, I, I, I have some skepticism of the corporate social responsibility movement for for a specific reason, right? That, in, in a sense, the kind of example that you described, you know, if a Walmart moves into a community where there is a thriving local business, uh, uh, where there is a local business community that's doing, you know, that's growing and, and so forth, and then the Walmart, uh, then, then those businesses can't compete with Walmart. You know, there are a lot of cases like that, and we, it's easy for us to say, well, that was very irresponsible of Walmart to, to move into that community. But really, if you think of it, who's to blame in that situation? Who is, who is harming or causing those small companies to fail? It's the buyers. It's us. It's the consumers. right? We're perfectly free to avoid Walmart and to continue to patronize our local I mean, the point is that we as consumers, we kind of talk out of both sides of our mouth. <laughs> Most of us, of course, everyone's different. We say, gosh, I love the local downtown in my community. I'm glad it's not a bunch of big box stores. But when I need a new t TV, I don't go to the local shop. I go to Walmart or Best Buy or I order it from Amazon. <laughs> so it's like we want a certain kind of we want to live in a place that has thriving small businesses. We just don't want to patronize them. We want other people to patronize them. So we, we want to shop at Walmart, but then be able to walk downtown and window shop. And, and so, you know, we, you, you know, you sort of can't have your cake and eat it too. But that also acknowledges that the, the larger player has more resources to do it, and the mind of the consumer, to some degrees, can be very short-sighted in terms of what that looks at long-term. Well, so, you know, Nestle can come into a sustainable uh, in a sub-Saharan African place and talk about the fact that their formula is much better, and then it, it, it moves a consumer base to move away from doing what might be better in a health environment. And it's not to say that it's bad or worse, it's just to say, how can it use itself in a much gl more global context to, to, to create and, and build some of the strengths that are either in place there or, or, or mitigate some of the, the other impacts that come on? Yeah, but again, my point is then, Who's making the mistake there? It's us. It's the citizens. It's the consumer. So, so the question is, what's the what is a remedy for that problem? So we could say, well, we're going to pass a law that says that large company X cannot enter that market. Well, that's going to have a lot of drawbacks. We don't know how would we design such a law. How would we enforce it? It's like you know, if we want people to, you know, not to be swayed by this, the Pied Piper of. Nestle or Walmart, well, we need to educate our fellow citizens to behave in it, you know, to have preferences other than the ones they currently have, which of course we can certainly do through persuasion, but I I'm wary of using the legal and political system to try to make people want something other than what they want. The other thing, just a quick comment on CSR, because I've been thinking about this a lot lately, I've just written a, a book chapter on corporate social responsibility. There's a problem, especially if we're talking about literal corporations that, you know, Nestle or Walmart, you know, who are the owners of Nestle, the owners of Walmart, the owners of Amazon? It's shareholders. And 
what CSR typically means or policy, CSR policies are typically designed not by shareholders, but by executives of those companies. We're saying, well, you know, we, we feel like the company ought to use some of its profits to support environmental protection or to support this kind of philanthropy or whatever. You know, I, on this, I sort of side with Milton Friedman, who wrote a sort of an infamous article in 1970 arg with, the, with the deliberately inflammatory title, the, the social responsibility of business is to increase its profits. And what he, but, but he's been sort of misunderstood. What Friedman didn't mean business per se or business people or people involved in business should not be socially responsible. His argument was companies, especially corporations, should focus on efficiency and maximizing their profit because what happens to that profit? Well, it goes back to the shareholders in the form of dividends and capital gains. The shareholders can then use that accumulated wealth to pursue whatever socially responsible activities they can. In other words, Friedman's argument is, why do you want managers deciding how the shareholders' assets should be used in a socially responsible way? The managers should just pass that money right back to shareholders. That gives shareholders more money that they can use to support environmental causes, to support whatever kind of philanthropic activities they want. Questions? Thanks again. Well, again, uh, a very, very good presentation. I think the I think we are being recorded, and I think at some point the presentation will be available on the website for YouTube. I, I encourage you, even more so, to visit the website. You've got the literatures in front of you. Please, again, I encourage you to take them, uh, make use of them. There are other very great lectures on the website. Um, it is not just tonight we're talking about, we're talking about the future. And I think you would also find on your tables a copy of Peace, Love, and Liberty. Oh, come on, who could go wrong with that? <laughs> By Tom Palmer. Again, please take the book with you and we can talk a little further uh, to anybody who's interested in supporting or being more active in the NASA Institute. Uh, Professor Klein, again, thank you. It was indeed a pleasure having you. I think we've all benefited uh, tremendously from what you've shared with us this evening. Um, to our recipients, no longer nominees, uh, thank you for being so gracious as to accept first our nominee and then, of course, our awards. Um, to your families and friends and other supporters who have come out. We do, again, thank you for your presence. Um, the hotel and uh, the staff, uh, thank you for our meals and accommodating us at <coughs> cost. So I, I want to end the evening by saying that this tonight is, is only possible by the participation of persons who come out like yourselves to, to, to join us. And there's nothing like word of mouth to spread good news. My final words is I encourage you, please, spread the good news you heard here tonight. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you, and good evening. Thank you.